it's kind of one of the strangest objects in the Messier catalogue in that in some sense it doesn't actually belong there at all because it's actually just a double star rather than a fuzzy thing at all. So what we're looking at is that pair of stars in the middle there. So there's all sorts of nice things in this picture like a nice little Bard spiral galaxy and a few other galaxies dotted around but actually the Messier object is that pair of stars. I don't know why the object has remained in there for as long as it has, well obviously it can't be taken out now because it's part of the original sequence. So it's a slightly strange one. First of all, we have to talk a little bit about how they ended up being a double star in the catalogue at all. What Messier was doing was looking for things which weren't comets. So he was looking for fuzzy objects which had just been confusing people when they were looking for comets that weren't actually comets. And so he constructed this catalogue. Now of course a binary star like this doesn't look like a comet at all doesn't look even slightly fuzzy but the reason why it ended up in there is that as well as just scanning the skies and looking for new objects that hadn't been catalogued before he also went back to look at things that had been seen before by other people to try and add them to his catalog to try and produce this definitive catalog of the fuzzy things in the sky and in the previous century a guy called Hevelius had constructed a, a much smaller catalog of various fuzzy things that he'd spotted and he had said that somewhere in this region of the sky he'd seen a pretty bright pair of stars that were surrounded by some fuzziness, some nebulosity. Um, and uh, so what Messier was trying to do was trying to re reproduce wh what it was that Hevelius had found. He found this pair of objects in roughly this part of the sky that Hevelius had said there should be this fuzzy pair of stars. Uh, he looked at them, ascertained that they weren't actually fuzzy, but because he'd now sort of made a record of them, they ended up being added to his catalogue as Messier 40, the 40th object in the catalogue. I think this was sufficiently early in the catalogue, he was sort of putting everything down that he found. If you look later on, I think it gets a little pickier as to which things up, end up in the catalogue. Turns out it wasn't even the object that Hevelius had found either. The binary star that Hevelius had found was a much brighter pair of stars a bit further away. Uh, so he'd actually even found the wrong pair of binary stars. So Hevelius had said this other pair of stars had nebulosity around them, but it turns out they don't either. They're just much brighter. And it's hard to tell. If you've got two bright stars close together and you've not got a very good telescope, it's easy to convince yourself there's lots of fuzziness around them. Do you think really he shouldn't have put it in then? Like, was he... It feels like he made a mistake. But it's kind of good science to actually record your mistakes as well, right? It's kind of good science to say, well, I looked for this fuzzy object because I've been told there was one there, but actually this is what I found and it isn't fuzzy. So it's actually sort of good practice to have recorded that. Whether that should then have ended up in his final catalogue of objects is a different question, but actually to record it and make a note of it is clearly an important thing to do. So the next part of the story is it then was lost because actually uh, Messier had recorded where, he, where this object was. Various people then tried to find it again. People like Herschel uh, looked for it and failed to find it. And so for a long time it was thought that Messier had just messed up completely and there wasn't actually a double star at this location at all until 1968 um, when a, an American amateur astronomer was, uh, went th back through Messier's catalogue and actually figured out what pair of stars it was that Messier had actually observed and for the first time was able to say this is Messier 40. But Mike, Messier's catalogue is quite famous. How can you have a lost object? Why was that not like one of the great mysteries of astronomy? I, I guess at least in part because it was just this double star and so no one was hugely exercised by the fact that they couldn't actually find a double star. Why couldn't they find it? I mean, Messier would have given us its coordinates. Why could like some pretty good astronomers like Herschel not find it? I honestly don't know. I mean, it, it shouldn't be that hard to find. Um, and, and indeed, you know, this guy in 1968 figured out, well, these are the coordinates Messier gave, and you have to then process the coordinates because the, the pole of the Earth moves, which means the coordinate system changes a bit. But that's easy enough to do. Um, once he'd done that, he said, and slap bang in the location, Messier said, said there should be this pair of ninth magnitude stars, this pair of ninth magnitude stars. So it was relatively easy to find once somebody bothered to do a good job on it. Because no one knew about it until 1968, they hadn't been studied in much detail before, and actually even subsequently, because it's just a pair of stars, no one's actually looked at it that closely. But one obvious question when you see a pair of stars like that is whether they're actually physically associated with one, one another, whether they're a binary star pair of pair of stars in orbit around one another or whether it's just two objects that happen to lie along the same line of sight. Um, so there's a little bit of work on that. Um, in the early 2000s, somebody looked at this in some detail, started looking at, for example, you could measure this thing called proper motion, which is measuring the movement of the stars on the sky, because stars are all orbiting around. And these two stars are actually just moving linearly apart from one another. They're not doing anything more dramatic than that. Now, if they're a binary star, you'd expect them to start orbiting around each other, but they're just moving apart, which again gives the impression they're probably just two random things which just happen to be going on their own paths and you just happen to be seeing the point where they're passing each other. But it wasn't very definitive because the definitive way to measure a distance in astronomy is this, through this technique called parallax, where you actually make an observation of a star, you wait six months, you make another observation of the star because the Earth's moved around the sun in the meantime, 
you're looking at the star from slightly different directions and so the star actually appears to wobble backwards and forwards in the sky. You can do the same thing yourself by just by looking at your finger with one eye and then the other eye and your finger seems to jump from side to side. So you do the same thing in astronomy to measure the distances. This pair of stars is sufficiently distant that actually it turns out that the parallax is quite hard to measure. Um, and at the time when this study was done in the early 2000s, the best astrometric, so measuring the positions of stars data that there was, was this thing called the Hipparchos satellite. And it turns out Hipparchus had really essentially failed to measure the distance of this pair of stars. It had actually tried to measure the distance to them, but the parallaxes were too small for Hipparchus to record, so it didn't get anything like a sensible distance to them. They're of similar apparent magnitudes. They have similar kind of brightnesses. Uh, one's a little brighter than the other, but it could be that they're actually quite a long way apart, and one's actually intrinsically quite a lot brighter than the other. But so the thing that's, that's new um, since this study in the early 2000s is Hipparchus was the state of the art, there's now a new astrometric satellite out there, a thing called Gaia. Just last month it released its first set of data. When I was actually reading up about this object, I thought, oh, I wonder if that's in the Gaia catalogue. So I went and looked it up. Sure enough, both these stars are in the Gaia catalogue, and there are now definitive distances to both of them, as measured through these parallax techniques, just from the first year of Gaia data. So it's going to be amazing. When Gaia gets its full data set, it's going to have absolutely stunning data. But just the first year of data already got good distances to these two stars. Turns out one's much further away than the other. So they really aren't a physically associated pair of stars at all. Um, so the distance are one of them's about 350 parsecs away and the other's about 140 parsecs away. And remember parsecs about three and a bit light years if you want to convert. So one's a bit over a thousand light years and the other must be about 500 light years. So I told you about it and you said oh why don't you write a paper? So I did write a paper and here it is. So when you write a paper typically this is a bit short for a scientific paper I should stress they're usually a bit longer than that but when you write a paper usually the first thing you do with it well you submit it to a journal for publication so we sent it off to a journal a thing called the observatory for publication but the other thing you do is you send it to a preprint archive a thing called archive A-R-X-I-V where all astronomical results are stored away astronomical papers are stored away so anyone can look them up. I sent it last night <laughs> this morning I got a letter saying your submission has been rejected, um, essentially not to put too fine a point on it because it's too trivial for publication. Do you agree with so, that decision? No, I've actually already sent in my appeal as to why this is a clearly an important astrophysical result and therefore should be stored on the archive. Why is it important? In the grand scheme of things, it isn't very important. As I mentioned earlier, you know, people have written entire papers on this object. There we go, that's the, that's the 2002 paper. It's because people are always interested in Messier objects and you want to know a bit more about them. And so, you know, there's actually a whole, uh, there's a whole website that's got information about all the Messier objects. Um, and it's got, and you know, we don't yet have the definitive answer until yesterday about what Messier 40 actually is. And this paper, you know, it gets a part of the way there and it starts suggesting that they're probably physically unrelated stars. But if you look at the conclusions there, they have to be a bit vague in them because actually they haven't quite nailed it. And what the Gaia data did is actually completely nails it and shows that these two really are physically unrelated stars. So we've kind of put a line under what this object is in that actually it isn't really an object at all. It's just a pair of stars that happen to lie along the same line of sight. out there somewhere like we don't know about it. Could well be and, and presumably you know so it's also thought that most stars form in clusters so actually there must be a whole bunch of of the sun's former nursery mates out there somewhere in the Milky Way. This would be one of the things I would grab. This would be the thing you'd be taking home is it? It, it, it would possibly. <laughs> if the president of the Royal Society came up to me and said Brady we think you're a nice guy you can take anything home to display on your coffee table I think it would be this one. It's not a bad choice. It's a, it's a seriously interesting piece.